Hello everybody, I am Bill Harris and welcome to Life Questions, a program that addresses the issues of life from a biblical perspective. You know, life takes us through so many changes and it is so important to have God's perspective in order to live victoriously, especially since he is the one who provides life. The word of God is replete with answers to life's many questions. They're so complex questions. And so we have invited a local group of ministers to prayerfully review the many questions that you, the viewers, have sent us for answers. And I'd like you to meet them at this time. First up, we have Pastor Rich Reiki, who is from Delphus Trinity United Methodist Church, followed by Pastor Bill Mackey of the Zion Lutheran Church in St. Mary's, Ohio. And then there's Pastor Mark Bird of Revive Ohio, a statewide ministry uh, that is in Anna, Ohio. And rounding up our panel today is Pastor Ryan Bright of the Grace Point Church of the Nazarene in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And by the way, you are the youth pastor there, I understand. Yes, I am. Happy to have you with us today. Now, um, as you know, we, we take questions from our viewers. Um, and uh, some of these can be, goodness, some of these can be, Pretty juicy questions and the like. And I'd like to ask you one that uh, I think um, everybody can identify with. Let's start with this one. This person writes in and says, my marriage is a mess. I am trying really hard to heal things and to keep reminding myself that I need to stay with my husband because of the children. But I am miserable and don't know what to do. Counseling is not an option, she says here. We already tried that. Please help. So she's reaching out for help. This is an all-male panel, too. I just happened to notice that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, Our wives would have something to say about that. Right. <laughs> yeah. You would? Yeah. What do you think? This is, again, she's reaching out for help. What do we do here? Well, I think the first thing is if you're, you're reaching out for help, you don't limit your options. So I think when disaster strikes, all options are on the table. That doesn't necessarily mean divorce. It means where am I going to get help from? That might be church. That might be counselors, Christian brothers, sisters praying for her and the family. Um, the, the premise is a little off. Uh, I need to stay together. I, 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 I need to stay together for the children. You know, mm -hmm. I, one of the great sins in our culture, I think, is we made our children into gods. Um, that the, the only human relationship that's second to our relationship with the Lord is the relationship between a husband and a wife. And so the marriage has to be put back in central focus mm -hmm. for the sake of the marriage, not for the mm -hmm. sake of the children. Right. Because when she values the relationship with her husband and what God wants her to get out of that, what God wants her to give to her husband, what God wants her husband to give to her, you know, she can go through and read Ephesians chapter 5, and we can talk a little bit about that maybe if you want, about uh, the primary way in which a guy receives love and the primary way in which a woman receives love. Uh, but when it seems like nothing's working, you have to start with a basic thrust of um, what, what are my priorities? And my priority has to be I want to honor God in this, and I honor God by loving my husband well first, even if he doesn't deserve it. Because even if he's a jerk. Even if he's a jerk, <laughs> because uh, God loves us even when we're jerks. And we have to be willing to forgive if we're going to be forgiven, Jesus says. And so what better, it's easy to do with a stranger. It's easy to do with the person who cuts you off on the street that you're not going to see again. It's hard to do with the person you say, share the same bed with. Yes, yes, yes. yes. And yep. Go right ahead. Oh, along with that, I'd say I completely agree with everything you said. The things that I would add to that is um, make sure if you've only tried one counselor, mm -hmm. um, a lot of times a couple doesn't fit with one counselor. So by all means, um, I definitely recommend trying another counselor. Make sure you go to a Christian counselor. And then um, also on top of that, um, I would say um, I do love your heart that you're obviously trying to make this marriage work. Right. You know, and, and so many times in society we try to throw our marriages away. Um, it's obviously that you, you do sense that, yeah, behind all this, I, I feel like God's called me to commit to this marriage. Obviously, I think all of us would say something too different. Maybe you guys have some experience on this, but I think all of us would say something different if it's a situation of physical abuse. Right, right. But you say Christian counselor. You emphasize Christian counselors, right. what you yeah. said. Why is that? 
Um, so I think there are a lot of great non-Christian counselors out there. My wife is a Christian counselor. The benefit of a Christian counselor is if she's writing into a show that's asking Bible questions, she's, I'm assuming she's a follower of Jesus. And we do have a different standards when it comes to human sexuality. We do have different standards when it comes to life. And like you pointed out, what's first? For us, what's first is not our kids or even our marriage. Ultimately, those are important things and biblically important, but our first priority is God. Yeah, I would say basically that God is for marriage, right? Yes, he, he, he started it, he condoned it, he created it, and he's for marriage, right? And so that whole perspective about marriage is, is it in balance, right? Is it in alignment with God and with God's word? And know that God is for you and he is for your marriage. And so that he's on your side. And sometimes we lose sight of that because all we see is what's happening in the relationship. And sometimes we get blinded by the trees for the forest, mm -hmm. right? And, and know that God is for it and God wants to heal and God wants to restore. And sometimes we lose sight of that. We lose track of that because of the trials and tribulations that we're going through. Yeah, and I would direct uh, her to, you know... Um, Keep her focus also on the Father, you know, um, and uh, obviously I'm sure she's been praying. If, if not, I would recommend that she do pray uh, about the situation, but, you know, to, uh, to realize that uh, he's at work. Mm. He's, he's in the process of doing something for her that she may not be able to see yet, um, and it may be difficult to go through. Um, but to trust that he's already working on the situation. Mm -hmm. And definitely don't do this alone. Even if you're not talking Correct. to a counselor, make sure you're talking to a, a right. pastor, a Christian friend who's Correct. mature in the Lord, like she, you already she, mentioned. She does need to share that. Which yeah. is, right. She's right. got to get that out With somebody who can walk with you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Not, not somebody who's going to commiserate with you, but somebody who's going to walk <laughs> through you with it and you know, pray, pray with you and hold you up, hold your marriage up and be an encouragement and a model. Right. You know. Okay, very good. Right. The question that also relates to family here, question uh, says, I am the parent of three kids in elementary school. I do not want them to walk away from their faith when they get older, or when they are older. What can I do now to instill a true love of God inside of them? This is something that, this is real. I mean, right. I, let, me, let me preface this by saying this. On the other side, when a child leaves high school, there are, there are now springing up across the country places where you can send your child before they go to college mm. that helps to prepare them mm. for what they're going to be dealing with on campus so they won't mm. lose their faith. Right. So it's a real concern, I would say, this parent has. Right. Yeah. right. Go right ahead. Well, you know, teach a child in the way that he should go and he won't soon depart from it. So um, if you don't want your children uh, who are in elementary school to walk away from the faith, and you need to, to teach your, ch your children about the faith. You need to demonstrate the faith. You need to take them to worship. You need to open the Bible and read it with them. You need to teach them how to pray. Yeah. Um, you know, you need to do those things. Uh, you know, the, for me, being Lutheran, the, the catechism was very important for seventh and eighth graders is, is when we usually teach that. But you can start early about the basics of your faith. Um, and, and what Jesus means to you as, as you see it through the lens of, of your denomination or faith. So um, if you don't want your child to walk away from faith, you got to teach them about faith so that they understand why they don't want to walk away from it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, a, that's a great point, uh, Bill, but I would go one step further and say, what's the context of the question? And I guess it's, I don't want my kids to walk away from the faith. Well, what do you mean by that? Do you want them to still be in church when they're older? Or do you want them to have a relationship with the Father? Because mm -hmm. yeah. the, the emphasis is, if you really want your kids to uh, connect with uh, the Lord, you have to have a vital relationship with the Heavenly Father yourself. That's the best thing Correct. that you can do. Because if you're living that out consistently, yep. if you're They're reading your it. word, if you're modeling prayer, you know, this is the wrong uh, question to ask a pastor because <laughs> our, our, our right. kids are like the go-to janitors, you know, the door unlockers, the pew cleaners, the back, you know, every time the church doors are open, my girls got drug along to, to do different things. They also got a lot of exposure to some great people, some, some here. 
Mark and his music ministry and rub shoulders with some other people and really have exposure to see people living out their faith. You know, I've hosted in my home missionaries from Africa and Nepal and, and India. And when, when they get to hear the stories as we're sitting around table mm -hmm. and they, their mind just spins more than it ever would if I just sat down and forced them to go to Sunday school or forced them to go to youth group. You can force kids to do those things, but it's only if they have a relationship that they're going to continue with that when they're gone because they've built that trust for themselves and it's no longer mommy and daddy's relationship, yeah, it's yeah. mine. Well, in other words, you're saying that it's not their parents' religion, no, right. it's theirs. Right, it's right. but it starts with the parent having a genuine faith first sure, to sure. model that. Sure, right. yep. and, sure. You know, and I think Ryan probably sees that all the time. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with you 100%, Rich. And when it comes to attending church, one of the things that I tell parents, there are parents who choose to make their kids come to church and the kids grow up loving Jesus, loving the church, and there, there's no bitterness, but then you have kids that are made to grow to church and they grow up and there's bitterness and anger and resentment at that. And there's no one size fits all answer. So I don't wanna make it uh, too simple, but the difference I've seen is if a parent makes their kid go to church, they drop the kid off, they leave, and the parent has no relationship with Jesus, they don't attend church, they don't volunteer at church, and they want that for the kid, the kid is gonna see rules, hypocrisy, and they're not gonna yeah. see a relationship with Jesus. But if you go to church, you're excited about it, you're engaged, um, then they're gonna be excited and engaged. I think you're absolutely right that as a parent, your kids are naturally gonna have the best chance to be excited about what you're excited about, whether that's Jesus or really anything else in life. So be careful of your own passions as a parent. Yeah, and I would say basically at the end of that, just to put the cherry on top, I really think that your kids need to see you and what you're valuing. And so they learn by watching, not just what you say, here's what you should do, Here's what I do, right? When they, when they see you value the word, when you're getting in the word, you're spending time in the word by yourself and they see that and you're living it out like you guys are all saying, that really has more of an impact than we realize mm -hmm. because they're watching. They're listening, but they're watching our lives. Mm -hmm. And so when we put our priorities into alignment with God, then our children will follow suit. Now, and the scripture that Bill shared even if they depart, right, they will return because how many of us have had instances where we've met children and they've drifted, they've strayed, mm -hmm. but then mm -hmm. they find themselves like the prodigal son yes. needing to return home. Well, yeah. I drifted. What did you say? I drifted. Mm -hmm. I mean, once I got out of high school and into college, things kind of, you know, I fell away from going to worship and those kinds of things and then um, wound up coming back into church and going to seminary and becoming wow. ordained. Well, so I mean- What was the turning point for that? Uh, how, how did that happen? Um, for me, actually, it had to do with a spiritual weekend mm -hmm. called Via de Cristo, which is a lot like a mass. Wow. And uh, it was did, in did that situation it? that um, uh, I was listening to a talk which centered on Good Friday. And um, uh, for me, I, uh, I came away in tears and was by myself and really believe I heard God speak my what, name. What triggered it? What, what specifically? What would you... The crucifixion of Christ. The crucifixion? Yeah. That, um, the fact that you knew he, would, he, he died for you? or uh, I, I don't know how to explain it. it uh, I knew all of that going into mm -hmm. the weekend. Uh, it became real. Yeah, okay. That's... It was spirit-led. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. So that turned my life completely around and brought me into ministry. And I will be celebrating uh, 22 years of ministry in June. But, the seed, was, but the seed was planted in your By youth. my parents. Yeah. My parents, I went to church, I was confirmed, I loved going to church. I would stop into the church and I would pray at the altar, which was a no-no for Lutherans. You know, the only one who went up to the altar was the pastor. But I, went, I would go right up into the altar and kneel down on his kneel thing and, and I would pray and I would walk away. And nobody would come into the sanctuary. Nobody was there. I was always alone whenever I would do it. And, you know, I always felt a close relationship. But um, in college, I fell away. But I came back. Amen. So just what you said. This is a great story. Great story. Well, all right. 
Well, let's pause and take a break then. And we'll, okay. We're going to take a break and we'll be back with more with these fine gentlemen right after this. Don't go away. There's still a lot more discussion to come on this episode of Life Questions. But first, do you have a question for a future show? Email it to lifequestions at WTLW.com or call us 419-339-4444. You can also suggest pastures you feel would be a good fit for our panel. Again, send your question ideas and pasture suggestions to lifequestions at WTLW.com. Now back to the discussion. All right, we're back. And uh, here's a question that uh, in, in our pre-conversation before we took air today, Bill said this is something that he would feel very comfortable with. And um, so it's, this is, a, this is a, a letter that came in. I want to increase my relationship with Jesus. Excellent, isn't it? Right. Please give me some basic idea of what I can do every day. Uh, well, what I would suggest first of all, is you need to make sure that you open the scriptures and you read the Bible and, and frankly, read the whole Bible because the Old Testament speaks about Jesus also. Mm -hmm. And if you want a relationship with Jesus, you kind of need to know about uh, what the Old Testament says. Uh, but then after uh, you continue to read the Bible each day, then you also, uh, you need to pray each day. Uh, you need to lift up your, uh, your concerns and your, your joys and uh, uh, your questions, and, uh, and then you need to set aside time to listen, yeah, <laughs> right? Good. We all talk and then we, you know, we go away and we don't listen necessarily. But you can't establish a relationship and make it an intimate relationship without being able to listen to what the other person has to say. That's why reading the Bible is so important because that's where God speaks to us. God speaks to us in the scriptures. Um, and then the Holy Spirit will open up those scriptures to what it is that maybe our concern is about or our question is about, so we might be able to interpret what it is for our situation. Okay. And then there are others like clergy, pastors, who will be able to also help us interpret those things in a, in a, in a sound biblical way and not just a self-justification way. Mm -hmm. So You hit a very, very basic problem that I think many Christians have, and that is getting before the Lord sharing with him our laundry list of what we want him to do for us today and then getting up and walking away and not listening. That's a very basic problem. Yeah. Dwell on that a little bit more. I mean, what do you get out of that, gentlemen? Well, I would say that basically what relationship do you have on earth and think about relationship problems on earth. And a lot of times the one says to the other, you're not listening to me. And so that listening piece is so vital in every relationship that we have, and especially in this piece about God, right? Do we take the time to actually listen? And somebody asked me, what does that look like? What does listening look like, right? Making eye contact and actually listening, you know, eye contact with the word. I love what Pastor Bill said, because we pray, we bring things before the Lord, which partially our laundry list, right? Yeah. But there are other things that are concerning our heart because if they're concerning our heart, then they're concerning our father. And so he wants to speak back and he wants to answer. And many times for me, at least, he answers me right through the word because that word is living and active, mm -hmm. Hebrews 4.12. And I think it comes back to an understanding of the word first. And you know, to Bill's point, we've got to be engaged in the word, but many people approach the word almost like it's a biography, like I'm, I'm reading about George Washington or something, and I got all the facts and the figures and the players, and, and, I, and I get this, but it doesn't mean anything to me. And, and a different way to approach it is, this is God's autobiography. autobiography. It's what He wants us to know about Himself. He's, he's revealing Himself to us. He's, he's showing us how He works and how He interacts and how He engages. And, the scripture says it's living and active, so it's current even today that it's engaging uh, with us in our time and in our mm -hmm. place. And mm -hmm. that's how you develop a relationship by engaging with the word, but allowing the word to connect you in relationship with the heavenly father. But you also have to engage in the things that Jesus did. I mean, Jesus came not just to save us, but to model for us the life to live. And so Jesus is going away to pray. He's 
connecting with other believers, right? He's uh, doing the work of the Heavenly Father on a regular basis. He's loving people. He's displaying the character of the Father. When we do those things, it builds connection mm -hmm. with our Heavenly Father. Okay. Were you going to say something? Uh, I certainly can. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a great question. How do I grow closer to Jesus? In agreement with all these guys said, and I think I, uh, this is something we keep coming back to, make sure if you're struggling with those things, mm -hmm. go to your pastor, go to a mature Christian, and say, hey, can you teach me how to read the Bible and pray? If uh, a teen or adult asks me to read the Bi teach them how to read the Bible, I show them how I read the Bible. I show them how I journal. I show them the reading plans I use. I might take them to the YouVersion Bible app, which is completely free and has all kinds of plans and places to get you started. And then if they're having trouble praying, I take them to the Lord's Prayer and say, let's look at this, uh, how Jesus taught us to pray, which it's not just a laundry list. It's talk about how great God is. Talk about how you're seeing his kingdom come to earth, how you want to see it. You know, Ask God uh, to forgive your sins, forgive those who have sinned against you, and pray against the temptations that you're going to face and the evil that might come your way that day. How do you view um, Bible literacy among Christians today? Do you oh. think there's much? Um, do you think that there's much knowledge among Christians? Uh, well, I today? think there's, there's fewer Christians. And then among those fewer Christians, I would say there's a fewer who actually spend time reading the Bible and the scriptures. Um, it makes a nice coffee table piece um, and everybody can see that they have one. But um, a lot of Christians don't even open it. They think maybe if they go to worship and they'll, they'll hear the scriptures read there and maybe what the pastor has to say and that's enough. Well, even seminary professors tell the student pastors who are going through that they need to also read the Bible for themselves and not just for the weekly lessons, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and, uh, and I think that uh, there's a large segment of believers who don't actually spend time in the Word. And we have a lot of people in my church who are certainly very, very biblical, biblically literate. And I'm sitting here with, you know, four other guys who definitely are. I think the question we all have to ask ourselves too, are we reading it? But even more so, are we actually obeying it? Mm -hmm. You know, we have more Bible translations than we've ever had before. The Bible's mm -hmm. always the number one bestseller. The issue number one is, are we reading it, right? Not just sitting on our coffee table. Then question number two is, are we actually listening to the voice of God in it and obeying it? Well, well and the, to just kind of piggyback on that, when you have an intimate relationship with somebody, somebody you trust, and you ask them something, you can expect and hope that they'll give you an honest answer. And it may not agree with your position. Right. You have to be willing also to accept the fact that what you're asking Jesus might be a no. You know, it might be a no. Right. I, th I think uh, there's one aspect of this that we're, that we're missing a little bit, and I do think biblical literacy might be lower as a percentage of the population, even though we have all these tools, and it's for the reason that these guys talked about, it's that there's so many options, there's so many websites, there's so many translations, there's so many teachers available that I will choose those voices I want to listen to right. as opposed to being conformed to the Word. Correct. So I, I won't listen for God's voice in this. I, I will seek out that answer that I want that sets with me and I'll listen to that voice and then I can ignore the other stuff because people aren't digging in themselves. Right. Yeah, and a lot of times it is we don't want to follow Jesus. We want to lead Jesus to the position we want him to yeah. be for us. Yeah. I kind of put it the way it, it's like, um, the, you know, the Holy Spirit is like the steering wheel of your life. And we at first give it over to him because we're all <laughs> excited about being new Christians. <laughs> And then when the Holy Spirit starts to take us down a road that we don't think looks too great, we want to grab the steering wheel back and take it ourselves. And then, of course, when we have an accident, we expect the Lord to give us a full explanation of why things went wrong. Right. You know. Well, the perfect scripture is the story of the rich young ruler who had all the right answers to Jesus's questions, who knew how to be justified, who was living a so-called righteous life. But when Jesus put his finger on the one thing that was hindering his connection yeah. with God, yeah. he walked away yeah. 
depressed. Sad, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. you know, many times that happens. I mean, I wish I could say I wasn't in that camp that I, <laughs> you know, but there have been times that Jesus has put his finger on something in my mm -hmm. life and, and, and it's really a crisis of faith to say, will I take up my cross and follow him? Right. Yeah. And that's the crux of faith. Right. It, it is. And it, it requires, as Paul said in the book of Romans, becoming a living sacrifice. Right. And when you think about the sacrifices in the Old Testament to the Lord, and now the Lord is telling you, me, yeah. to be the sacrifice, which means saying no to my flesh a thousand times a day. <laughs> yeah. I think one of the things worthy of mentioning here too, Bill, is the fact that um, too many people just promise if you just have a relationship with Christ, your life will be just perfect from there on. Right. <laughs> right. And yet, yet God told us in this life, you will have tribulation, right? Yeah. You will go through these trials. I think it's better to prepare them. Uh, in fact, I had a, a, a gentleman that I was ministering to and actually became a pastor. And he, and he said, now, what is this going to cost me? Ooh. And I said, now, honestly, I'm being brutally honest with you. I said, it's going to cost you your life. And what happens when you give your life to Jesus, when you get closer to him, it literally will cost you your life, your old life, right? right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, let's, uh, two minutes here we have left and I want to turn to the question that, um, that you wanted to talk about. How can I be the hands and feet of Jesus with so few opportunities to serve in person because of the current restrictions we have sure. in society today? It's a valid question and I get asked this quite often actually in, in light of the times. And I'll say, first of all, um, being the hands and feet of Jesus are basically what? Serving, right? Mm -hmm. The hands and feet are to serve. And so many people have many needs. And even during this crisis uh, that has imposed the restrictions that we have, the actual needs of people are actually increased. Yes. And so what Jesus is expecting us to do, right, is be the hands and feet. How do you do that? And I think it boils down to this. How do you love your neighbor? Yeah, How do you love your neighbor? So, so are we supposed to not love our neighbor anymore because there's a restriction? And, you know, I was thinking about this, Bill, and, and it boils down to this. You know, there was a crisis in Jesus day when he was walking the earth and it was called leprosy. Mm -hmm. And so did Jesus say, well, you know, hey, leprosy's around, so just chill out and, and I don't want you to get it. No, he actually told his disciples to go out and cleanse the leper, you know? And he said, there's a need here and this is the most pressing need right now, physical sickness wise. And he said, go address it. So no matter what that is, there's so many ways to serve. There's ways to serve food. There's ways to serve clothing and all kinds of needs, basic human needs. Okay. And on that, uh, we're going to have to close. We're okay. Just wrapping it up uh, at the end of this program. But, you know, if you stay tuned again next week, uh, we'll be back and we'll have this same panel again. And we'll have a, another round of juicy questions from our viewers, you there in the audience. And uh, we'll take on those questions and give you biblical insight. So be sure you tune in again next week for another edition of Life Questions. Until then, I'm Bill Harris. Have a good day. Bye-bye. You've been watching TV44's newest locally produced program, Life Questions. Now we'd like your feedback. What did you enjoy about this show and what would you like to see more? Perhaps you have your own questions you'd like us to pose to our panel of pastors in a future show. Submit your questions now by email to lifequestions at wtlw.com or call us with your thoughts. We are able to discuss relevant topics with local pastors right here in the TV44 studio thanks to your financial support. Now is an excellent time to make a one-time gift to TV44 or consider becoming a monthly donor. 100% of your donation stays right here at TV44 and is used to spread the family-friendly, life-changing message of Jesus Christ. Secure donations can be made online at WTLW.com, by phone, by mail, or in person. Again, share your questions for consideration for future shows or just contact us with your comments at lifequestions at WTLW.com. <laughs>